Hello and welcome to episode 13 of the Monday Night Review. I'm sitting in my mum's studio at the end of her garden and I want one. I'm so jealous. I've literally been in here for about two minutes already. I'm completely sold. Anyone who's got a an office or a shed or anything in your garden, fully jealous. Um, thanks for your lovely feedback on last week's episode on Jamaica Inn. We've returned from Cornwall. As, as you obviously now know, because I'm in my mum's garden in Hampshire. So we're here for a week, up the road from Hinton Amp now, which you can hear about in episode four. I think we're going to go and hang out there tomorrow. And I was planning on doing a topic, this topic further into the future, but my family and I were discussing it last week, and we got so involved with it. <laughs> I'm doing it now. Brace yourself. It's going to be about twice the length of the usual episode because I've got so many notes on it. I had to stop myself buying loads of books about it (laughs) because I thought, don't need to do years of planning on this one. It's been done to death. I'd love to know afterwards if you prefer the slightly longer version or the slightly shorter version. I always think short and sweet is good, but then, oh, the devil's in the details. So today we're going to talk about the murder of Sandra Rivet and the disappearance of Lord Lucan. Ding, ding, ding. So Richard uh, Richard John Bingham was, when his father died, the seventh Earl of Lucan, born on the 18th of December, 1934, an Anglo-Irish aristocrat. Eton educated, he then served with the Coldstream Guards in West Germany from 1953 to 1955. He then became a merchant banker, but made the slightly dodgy career change soon after, which we will get on to later. I've listened to a few podcasts on Lord Lucan and pretty much every time he's portrayed as a sort of violent murdering gambler intent on destroying his poor wife. And whilst, of course, that's partly true, I don't think he was a picnic to live with. There's quite a lot of things that I've heard about that haven't been discussed in these podcasts that make this case not the cut and dried story that we often think it is. So Lord Lucan was An early member of the Claremont Club, an exclusive group of gamblers who used to meet at 44 Barclay Square in London's Mayfair, he developed a taste for gambling at bridge and backgammon and his losses regularly exceeded his gains. Other members of the club included Peter Sellers, Ian Fleming, Lucian Freud and the Duke of Devonshire. Despite his losses, Lucan left his job at the Merchant Bank and became a professional gambler. While his father was alive, he was Lord Bingham until he exceeded the title of Lord Lucan in 1964, just after he got married. He was known for his expensive tastes. He drove an Aston Martin. He drove powerboats. He was a big gambler. uh, And at one point, he was even considered for the role of James Bond. He was that kind of figure. In 1963, he married Veronica Duncan, and they went on to have three children. In 1972, he moved out of the family home in Belgravia to a property nearby and they engaged in a bitter custody battle, which Lucan lost, which was a bit of a surprise at the time because quite often peers of the realm would win custody of their children fairly easily. Uh, He began to spy on his wife and became obsessed with regaining custody of his children. What's often overlooked when discussing what would happen next is why he was so obsessed. And to understand that, we need to look a bit more at Veronica. Letters found after her death say it was Lucan who was going mad. She accused him of going insane. Um, He regularly lost thousands at Baccarat, which I don't think is a sign of insanity. I think it's just the sign of a gambler. But certain events leading up to the night in question we'll talk about that lead me to believe She's not quite telling it how it is. So let's look at Veronica a bit more. Veronica Duncan was born in East Sussex and raised in South Africa. She worked in London as a secretary and model until her sister Christina, who was married to the wealthy William Shand Kidd, introduced her to John Bingham in early 1963 at a golf function and they were married later the same year. They had three children, Francis, born in 1964, George, born in 1967, and Camilla, born in 1970. After the birth of her, fa- of her second child, she got postnatal depression. Uh, her husband actively encouraged her to get help, 
was really keen for her to to get the help she needed. She agreed to get the help, but only if it was at home. He even studied books on psychiatry to try and help her and understand her condition more. She later said that she didn't receive sufficient help for her postnatal depression, which I think is true of the majority of women who struggled with it. Um, And it's still not treated as it should be to this day. She was also rightly deeply concerned about her husband's gambling and debts. It's worth noting that the working hours of a professional gambler it does not sort of fit happily around family life, even if you have a nanny and help, as Veronica will have had. Uh, Lucan would return home at around 6am, wake up around lunchtime and return to the Claremont for lunch. Veronica would often meet him there at 9pm, by which time I would have thought he was fairly, I'm not, I'm not necessarily drunk, but you know, He'd have been there for a while already. Uh, she no doubt felt cross and estranged from her husband. We all, all of us n- know that the newborn stage can be horrendous and having small children is difficult anyway. But with your husband working these hours and losing all of this money, it can't have been easy. In March 1973, after they separated, Lucan received a court order to take custody of his children and Veronica received care from nurses at their home before entering into a psychiatric clinic for a week. Later that year, the court declared that the children should be returned to their mother, despite Lucan's best attempts to have her deemed an unfit parent. Those who've interviewed people who knew the couple well say that few have anything positive to say about Lady Lucan, and apparently it was known within their social circles what a disaster their marriage was because she was a really difficult woman. woman. A lot of people would say that they felt sorry for Lord Lucan because his wife was so terrible. I'm sure being married to a professional gambler and not a very good one is awful. It was a truth universally acknowledged by those that that knew them that Veronica Duncan was an unpleasant woman. In the first few days of November 1974, Lucan bought his children a kitten from Harrods and delivered it to the family home. Later that day, the kitten was returned through his letterbox with its throat slit. The work of Lady Lucan, no doubt. And it's the incident that his friends believe tipped him over the edge. George Weiss, who played backgammon with him on the 6th of November, said he was playing on autopilot and was in a world of his own and was deeply distressed about what had happened with the kitten. On the 7th of November, 1974, Veronica and Sandra Rivet, the children's nanny, were putting the children to bed and afterwards Veronica asked Sandra to make her a cup of tea. Rivet went down to the unlit basement. A bulb had been removed and was later found on a nearby chair by the police to make tea where she was attacked and beaten to death with a lead pipe. Veronica went downstairs to see what was going on and was attacked herself. She screamed and her attacker told her to shut up and she then said she recognised her husband's voice. She grabbed him by the testicles and the attack stopped. Understandably. One of the children came downstairs. This is where it gets a bit confusing because there's a lot of different accounts, but obviously there were only two people there, supposedly. Lucan went upstairs to settle the child and Veronica fled to a nearby pub to summon help. When the police arrived, the door to the basement was open. This was quite often the case because they had two cats that they would leave the door open for. Um, There was no light in the hall, so they had to go and get a flashlight to use. They went down the stairs to the kitchen and found the walls splashed with blood, a pool of blood on the floor with some male footprints in it, and near the door connecting the breakfast room to the kitchen, a blood-stained sack. The top of the sack was folded but not fastened, and inside was the corpse of Sandra Rivet. As we know, she'd been battered to death with a blunt instrument. In the hallway, they found a length of lead piping covered in surgical tape, very bent out of shape and heavily blood-stained. At 10.30pm, Lucan called his mother to pick up the children, saying there'd been an incident at the house. She did this. She went and she, when she arrived, the police were there already. She explained that the parents were divorced and her son lived in a flat around the corner and she took the children to her house. Lucan then drove in a borrowed car to Uckfield in East Sussex to his friend Ian Maxwell Scott's house. Maxwell Scott was out, but his wife Susan was home. While there, Lucan wrote two letters and called his mother declining to speak to the police who were with his mother, saying that he would contact them the next day. 
The letters he sent to his London address and were to his brother-in-law, William Shand Kidd, and his friend Michael Stoop, from whom he'd borrowed the car. The letter was sent to Stoop's club in St James, and he opened it and threw away the envelope so it couldn't, it t- they couldn't trace it. The search of Lucan's flat showed he hadn't taken his keys, passport, wallet, checkbook, or driving licence. Bill Shan Kidd drove to London to pick up the letters. Um, Maxwell Scott had told him that that's where they'd been sent, and when he read them, he saw that they were bloodstained, and he took them straight to the police. The first letter to his brother-in-law reads, Dear Bill, The most ghastly circumstances arose to knife, which I briefly described to my mother. When I interrupted the fight at Lower Grail, Belgrave Street, and the man left Veronica accused me of having hired him. I took her upstairs and sent Frances up to bed and tried to clean her up. She lay doggo for a bit, and when I was in the bathroom, left the house. The circumstantial evidence against me is strong. In that V will say it was all my doing. I will also lie doggo for a bit, but I'm only concerned for the children. If you can manage it, I want them to live with you. Coots, Trustees, St. Martin's Lane, Mr. Wall, will handle school fees. Veronica has demonstrated her hatred for me in the past and would do anything to see me accused. For George and Francis to go through life knowing their father had stood in the dock for attempted murder would be too much. When they are old enough to understand, explain to them the dream of paranoia and look after them. Yours ever, John. The second letter included instructions for financial matters, which debts to clear, and what account to use, which debtors were just going to have to suck it up. What I find really interesting about this is throughout her life until her death in 2017, Veronica would say that he didn't care to pay the children's school fees. He wasn't interested. He wouldn't put money aside. Whereas in this letter, it's clear that... um, he's got a trust set up for the children to pay their school fees to michael stoop the owner of the car he wrote to dear michael i've had a traumatic night of unbelievable coincidence however i won't bore you with anything or involve you except to say that when you come across my children which i hope you will please tell them that you knew me and that all i cared about was them the fact that a crooked solicitor and a rotten psychiatrist destroyed me between them will be of no importance to the children I give Bill Shand Kidd on an account of what actually happened, but judging by my last effort in court, no one, let alone a 67-year-old judge, would believe, and I no longer care except that my children should be protected. Yours ever, John. Stoop's car, which was frequently borrowed by Lucan, whose own BMW wasn't working, it had a flat battery, and I think it was not something he had the money to, to fix, It was found three days later in New Haven, about 16 miles from Uckfield, where the Maxwell Scots lived. In its boot was a piece of lead pipe covered in surgical tape and a full bottle of vodka. The car was removed for forensic examination and later statements from two witnesses suggest that it was parked there sometimes between 5am and 8am on the morning of Friday the 8th of November. The police suspected suicide and a partial search of New Haven Downs was made using tracker dogs, but all that was found were the skeletal remains of a judge who disappeared years earlier. Uh, Police divers searched the harbour and a partial search using infrared photography was undertaken the following year with no results. A warrant for Lucan's arrest to to answer charges of murdering Sandra Rivett and attempting to murder his wife was issued on Tuesday the 12th of November 1974. Descriptions of his appearance already issued to the police force in the UK was then issued internationally. It's thought that Lucan attacked Rivet, believing her to be his wife, put her body into a canvas bag, so he'd come prepared, and then lay in wait for his wife. A few things do bother me though. If he'd killed his wife after he'd killed Sandra Rivet by accident, as he'd set out to do, and then left the house, it's likely that he would have had a lot more support from his friends to get a false alibi or a kind of biased trial. By leaving his wife alive, there's seemingly no doubt as to who committed the murders, although a lot of people, including the children, have said we only have Veronica's word for what really happened. Forensic evidence showed Lady Lucan and Sandra Rivett's blood on the lead piping found in the house and hair from Veronica, but not from Rivett, on that piping. There's no blood or hair on the piping in the car. The letters written to Bill Shand Kidd were stained with blood considered to be from both women. 
the letter to Michael Stoop had no blood on it at all. But it was later proven that the paper that Stoop's letter was written on had been torn from a writing pad in the back of the car. An examination of the bloodstains found inside 46 Lower Belgrave Street demonstrated that River had been attacked in the basement kitchen, while Lady Lucan had been attacked on the top of the basement stairs. The bloodstains found inside the Ford were the AB blood group. Veronica Duncan was an A and Susan Rivett was a B, so they believed that this might have been a mixture of blood from both women, and hair similar to that of Lady Lucan was also found inside the car. No fingerprints of Lord Lucan's were found in the house, weirdly. The inquest was held, uh, was opened on the 13th of November 1974, and on the 20th of November, a statement was taken from Lady Frances Lucan, which was read to the court. Frances had heard a scream, and a few minutes later had watched as her mother, with blood on her face, and father had entered the room. Her mother had then sent her to bed. She later heard her father calling for her mother, asking where she was, and watched as he left the bathroom and walked downstairs. She also described how Sandra Rivett did not normally work on a Thursday night. Just keep thinking, gosh, that's the, you don't know that's the last time you're going to see your father. The court also heard from the landlord of the Plumber's Arms, who described how Lady Lucan had entered his bar, covered head to toe in blood before she fell into a state of shock. He claims that she shouted, help me, help me, I've just escaped from being murdered, and my children, my children, he's murdered my nanny. Susan Maxwell Scott was interviewed as the last person to see Lucan alive. She described him as looking dishevelled, with a damp patch on his trousers by his right hip. He told her that he'd been walking past the house, looked through the basement window and seen his wife being attacked. He'd rushed in, slipped in a pool of blood at the bottom of the stairs. He said his wife was hysterical and accusing him of hiring a hitman. The jury came back with a verdict of murder by Lord Lucan, making him the first member of the House of Lords to be named a murderer since 1760, when Lawrence Shirley, 4th Earl Ferrers, was hanged for killing his bailiff. Lucan's friends and family declared the inquest was one-sided. Obviously, Lucan wasn't there to defend himself. Veronica's sister, Christina, said she felt great sadness and sorrow about the verdict. Lucan's fingerprints weren't found at the scene, but the police pointed out that the only way he could see his wife being attacked was by stooping to street level to be able to see into the basement kitchen. Though we know that he was used to spying on the house before that all this happened anyway, so I wonder if that it's not completely discredited if he's already snooping. Veronica says she never entered the basement that night, which contradicts his story. Some traces of her blood were found in the kitchen, the rear garden and on the canvas sack used to store its body, but this may have been down to contamination of the scene. The man Lucan claimed to have seen could not have left through the basement front door as it was locked and the rear door led to a walled garden and there was no sign of any escape having been made. No signs that um, the man left by ground level, the front door was on a latch as normal, there was no forcing of the front door and no witnesses reported seeing any person near 46 Lower Belgrave Street. Very, um, not surprisingly, the national press were happy to risk libel uh, accusations and condemn Lucan as a murderer. So what are the other options? Sandra Rivett died from four blows to the back of her head as she's the same height as Lady Lucan but a dress size bigger and had long brown hair and um, Veronica Duncan has blonde hair. Thursday was usually her night off. Lord Lucan would have known this. Veronica had two blows to her forehead and claims that she grabbed the testicles which ceased his attack on her. Uh, She describes it as being emotionally drained. I mean, I think if if he did it, he'd be at the end of his tether. He'd killed someone by accident who he hadn't meant to kill. Uh, he's probably shocked and horrified. When he, she then apparently flees to the pub, shouting she needed help and she'd nearly been murdered. A few things worth noting, at no point did Veronica go down to the basement. She says frequently she never went down to the basement. So how did she know the nanny had been murdered? Admittedly, um, it doesn't look good if she went down to look for the nanny because she was wondering where she was. 
Um, but she says she didn't go down into the basement, so I don't know how she knows. She, she runs into the pub shouting, he's murdered my nanny. Um, why didn't he finish the job? If he'd killed his wife, he'd have been able to stage a break-in or, you know, he was much loved by his friends and was very well connected. I'm not saying that that's an excuse, but that would have been a much easier route for him. Um, it's very, there's, it's very sinister to me that we only have Veronica's word for it and so many people doubt it. And there are a few things that don't tie in. After taking a cocktail of drinking drugs to end her life in 2017, uh, it was discovered that Veronica Duncan had cut her children out of her will, apparently for bad manners. She hadn't seen them for 30 years. She'd never met her grandchildren. She maintained her version of what happened during that night until her death. And some historians believe that the, there were letters that were found after her death that were planted there to keep her version going posthumously. Those who've interviewed people who knew the cover well say that the few have anything positive to say about it. In interviews between the disappearance of her husband and her death, she would often attack her children and her sister not long after the murder and the disappearance of her father, the Bingham children were sent to live with their aunt, Veronica's sister, Christina, who said it was clear that she was unable to care for the children herself. Which, again, ties in with the fact that Lucan seemed very obsessed with the safety of his children and whether she was a fit parent, which she always maintained was unfair. She just had postnatal depression and he was using that against her. But the fact that her sister then takes her children and, and says that she's unable to care for them seems quite a strong evidence for her not being in a, in a fit state to care for them. I think the children doubt their mother's version of events. Camilla, Lord Lucan's daughter, maintains the evidence against her father was circumstantial rather than conclusive. She's a QC, so she, is, she doesn't know what she's doing. There have been hundreds of reported Lord Lucan sightings since his disappearance, most recently in 2020. But to be honest, I think he killed himself at the time. Someone who is sort of as full of life and fast living as him, I don't think could just go and keep himself quiet for all of these years. Though his friends are so incredibly loyal that if anyone could have kept him under wraps, it was them. The letters sent to Shan Kidd sound like he's going to lie low. But then at the end, he ends with saying he wants his children to be protected and all of that. Interestingly, he only mentions two of his three children and whether that's because, it's, it, I don't know, it seems a bit strange to me. The letter to Stoop sounds like he's planning on doing what his friends refer to as the noble thing. Um, there are basically three options for where he went. One, the most likely, was suicide. His friends believe he would have scuppered his boat and tied a rock to himself, and that's that's why we haven't found anything. Two, his friends successfully got him somewhere safe, and then realised he was too much trouble to keep alive, killed him and buried him. I've heard this a surprising amount. Three, he got out to Mozambique, where he lived his life until his death, or he's there now as a very old man. Kind of unlikely, I think. Lucan's bankruptcy proceeded and his family were finally granted probate over his estate in 1999 but no death certificate was issued. Veronica maintained that the delay in probate was partly so the estate could pay the children's school fees. Um, she said he was not pronounced dead so we could pay for the children's education. That was the reason it took so long. If his body was found my son would have been the Earl of Lucan and we would have to pay death duties. We would not to be able to pay for the children's education. There are only four, seven and ten, so there would have been a lot of time ahead. His heir, George Bingham, Lord Bingham, was refused permission to take his father's title and seat in the House of Lords when Lucan was declared presumed dead in chambers on the 11th of December 1992 and then declared legally dead in October 1999. George succeeded in having his father declared dead on the 3rd of February 2016, a death certificate was issued and he finally inherited his father's title, becoming the 8th Earl of Lucan. I'll leave you with the words of my mother. I sat next to one of his great friends at dinner once and he told me exactly what happened. He either killed himself or he got away. 
I can't remember. Most frustrating thing she's ever said to me. I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. For pictures and more information, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Monday Night Review. As always, we'd love to hear your favourite true crime, paranormal or fascinating history story. And you can email them to themondaynightreview at gmail.com. I need to thank my sister for helping me with this episode by pointing out basically the bits I'd missed and sending me back into more hours of internet research, which is what I love doing. And my mother, who knew some people who knew some people involved in the case and would suddenly come out with the odd snippet of gold, even though she finds the whole thing deadly boring, apparently. I will see you next week. And until then, stay safe, be kind, and always check the back seat before you drive.